Good morning. My name is Scott Bloomer. I'm with AOCS. Hello and welcome to our AOCS webinar today entitled Exploring the Formulations of Personal Care Products Using a Digital Chemistry Strategy. Our presenter today is Dr. Jeff Sanders from Schrodinger. Jeffrey Sanders received his BS in Applied Physics from Worcester Polytechnic Institute, went on to get a PhD in Biophysics and Molecular Pharmacology from Thomas Jefferson Medical College. Since joining Schrodinger in 2013, he has served in several roles in both the scientific and the technical aspects of computational chemistry software. He's currently a product manager in the Materials Science Division, focusing on physics-based simulations in consumer packaged goods applications. If you have any questions, you can write them into the chat section and we will address them at the end of the presentation. Thanks for joining us. With that, Dr. Sanders. Thank you, Scott, and, and thank you everybody uh, for attending today and also uh, Amy and everyone else at ACOS for organizing this. So uh, what I hope to do in the next 45, 50 minutes is, is give you a few examples and rationalization for why uh, digital chemistry strategies are important for consumer goods. Obviously the topic today of is personal care goods, but um, it's not limited to that. Uh, there's a lot of other areas in food and beverage and cleaning uh, and other areas, cosmetics, I'm just gonna lump them into personal care for today. Uh, but there's a range of, of applications that our tools can be used for. Um, and it's actually really exciting now where we are at a crossroads of technology where we're able to actually address real problems uh, and, and provide some real solutions. So uh, I'd be remiss without you know, talking about who we are as a company, Schrodinger. Uh, I think it's very important. Uh, and also you know, what our mission is. And, and we're, we're trying to improve and change human health and the quality of life by the way medicine and materials uh, goods are, are discovered. And we're doing this through computational chemistry methods. Uh, and that, that's really been our push um, ever since we were founded over 30 years ago and continues to be today. So we, we've been around uh, for a while, uh, right? So we focus mainly on molecular modeling tools um, for scientific research and product development. Um, we're a global company uh, spanning several countries uh, and, and several sites even within the US. Um, we have over 700 employees now and over 50% of them have PhDs and a vast majority of those are focused in computational chemistry, biochemistry, uh, material science and related. So we have a, a very, big wealth of experience and expertise in, in these areas and related. Um, more than half of our company is dedicated to R&D, uh, which is very important for us. We try to reinvest uh, you know, all of our profits back into as much as we can. Um, and we, we are able to support, because of the size and scale of our company, um, scientific support and education along with applications um, for a vast majority of, of computational areas, as some I'll mention in a few minutes. Um, and of course, we're, since we're a software company, we're a software and, and service provider. Um, we're constantly innovating, we're constantly adding new things to the software, uh, making improvements, uh, staying up to date you know, with the bleeding edge. And, and we do that by releasing software four times a year, which is, is really fun. So you know, let's start with the real question is, why digital chemistry, why now? What is digital chemistry? So um, digital chemistry, for those that are not aware, is, is a way of just to describe uh, both physics-based simulations and also machine learning techniques. We'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and why now, though? Right? Why, why, why choose to do this at this current moment? Well, demands are changing. Um, I'll talk a little about sustainability, consumer trends, many other factors here are driving companies, whether they're direct to consumer, business to business, uh, and everyone in between to change. And that could be moving away from petroleum based ingredients and sources. It could be consumer trends, you know, wanting to shift away to ingredients everyone can understand, whether they're a lay person or they're a technical person. Uh, so that's one, one big reason and motivation for, for doing this now. Another is computational power and speed. So uh, for anyone that's seen in movies where they talk about mainframes or computational power, you see these gigantic rows of, of servers and server farms. Uh, that computational power is now shrunken down, at least for some of the technology that we'll harness uh, to a desktop computer that uses graphics processing units or GPUs, something that you know, frequently is talked about when, with uh, you know, video gaming on computers. So having both you know, a motivation and uh, you know, advances in technology um, 
are motivators for the entire industry as a whole. Where Schrodinger is uniquely positioned to contribute here is really providing, um, you know, state-of-the-art physics-based modeling and advanced machine learning tools, and also being able to democratize these tools by, you know, enterprise-level tools for ideation and analysis, so that you can not just keep modeling for the modelers, but extend it to experimentalists, engineers, scientists, and even management, so that they can see the entire R&D process and can contribute in a meaningful way. And, and, and to dive a little bit deeper, deeper since I've just mentioned, you know, these three, these three points. So physics-based modeling is going to be the majority of what I discussed during this talk um, is based on first principles. So we're using physics here to describe um, models, time, evolution, and, and how they evolve according to, you know, things that you may have learned in undergraduate physics classes. Um, it allows us to capture the complexity of many different types of molecules, um, sets of molecules, mixtures of molecules. And, you know, with the reliability of modern age force fields, which are the way that we describe the chemistry in a classic base sense for basis sets for quantum mechanical simulations, um, we're able to, you know, predict things that give us accuracy that we can translate to experiment. Whether we're validating experiments or we're enhancing or rationalizing, we're able to provide some level, if not quantitative level of agreement with what experiment can do. Of course, you know, machine learning being all the rage now, and, and of course we've been doing machine learning for a long time, it's just been called different names, um, allows us to take physics-based modeling and experimentation and combine them so that instead of brute force having to run 50,000 or 100,000 calculations or do a similar if not equal amount of experiments, we're able to combine those and we're able to do things like active learning where we can do some physics-based simulation for some of the data set, have some experimental information, and they're able to complement and build models that work playing off of each other. Um, and that allows us to get information faster, even faster than you know the speed ups that we have from computational power. And of course, tying that all together um, into team-based intelligence, right? So being able to collaborate, to see this data, to be able to build models that can then be deployed cross-organization is really important because we want to be able to be transparent and also have these models be put in the hands of someone that can provide unique, unique insight or take the data to a new level. And so uh, just to give one example of, of how we do this, because physics-based simulation has been around for even longer than Schrodinger has, there are, are many tools, there are commercial providers, there are open source tools where we try to you know, differentiate in terms from a software perspective is having a tool where you can have an interface, you're not just typing lines of code all day, but you're actually able to interact with your systems, whether in this case it's a protein system, if it's a polymeric system, it's a formulation, it's a surfactant system. Being able to run all these simulations, do the analysis and build and ideate within a single interface uh, allows you to do this. And this is something that we strong firmly on is that you can provide all of the power of very high level physics-based simulations, um, but also make it approachable and lower the barriers so that non-experts can you know, visualize, they can run a simulation, they can do the analysis, and they can do it in best practices and with you know, the right level of theory for the right application. And tying that all together as I've, I've, I've sort of, I'm sort of you know, starting to really hammer this down is being able to combine all of these tools into something that can be used and deployed without having to think about building new clusters or having to come up with a new cloud strategy for deployment and integration. Um, we provide the ability to do all of this for our customers. And so, you know, it should be as easy as opening your computer, looking at a particular project, seeing what data is being generated, what information is being spit out by a machine learned model, um, what your collaborators halfway across the world are doing, and then also being able to make decisions with all of that information. And that should be able to be done asynchronously, but also viewed in somewhat real time when data comes back. And that's really you know, what we see as, as the future is being able to do this um, at a scale that you know, pushes beyond just expert modelers, but incorporates various levels and various pieces of let's just say a product starting from you know early r d all the way down to experiments down to manufacturing so where do we operate you know where 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 is this applied where does it work so 
Um, as outside of consumer goods, the area that I play in very often, um, there are other areas where molecular simulation over the years has really found um, its calling in helping provide unique insider answers. And those are range everywhere from polymers, which I talk a bunch about because packaging and other things, a lot of polymers in the consumer space, um, pharmaceutical formulations, um, you know, coming up with a product, not just an active ingredient that can help cure a disease or treat uh, in the surface chemistry, catalysis, which is very important for making things that also, you know, ends up in the consumer realm as well. And also organic electronics, things like your cell phone um, screen or your computer screen, uh, you know, being able to develop and have tools that are applicable in all of these areas, um, but also have specific uh, workflows or specific, um, you know, applications or starting models is really important to us. And so this is why we focus in particular areas, but we also are able, since it's just physics at the end of the day, these tools work across different application areas. So for anyone that's not a modeler, wants to understand what is molecular modeling, I unfortunately can't tell you in five minutes. Um, it might be more like a couple hours. Um, we have online courses that are actually really good at doing that, but I'm gonna give you the 30 second condensed summary. So. Um, these axes aren't labeled. They really should be in terms of time and length scale. Uh, but the idea being that different levels of theory um, have different size and um, time scale constraints. And so as we move from a level of theory to another, we're going to apply different techniques or, or, or different methods. And ideally, we would try and combine all of them so we can get up to a, you know, an engineering level simulation, something like continuum level, like a computational fluid dynamics or a finite element simulation. So at the smallest scale, which is electronic, we're describing our molecule, our system um, with explicit electrons, which are modeled quantum mechanically, um, frequently using density functional theory, where we're able to describe uh, electronic properties. Oh, sorry, jumped back a bunch. It happens when you keep your hand near the end button. Okay, getting a little excited there. Uh, so DFT methods, QM methods are really good at describing optoelectronics properties. Also reactivity, understanding kinetic mechanisms for catalysis, for reaction mechanisms in general, but they're often limited to 100, maybe 200 atoms. So something very small, um, not very representative of the full product. Uh, that's when you move up. Up to atomistic, so moving away from this Newton second law, F equals ma, where we're describing atoms by a force field, something I mentioned earlier, to capture the relevant uh, atomistic properties of so bonds, charges, um, size, and being able to simulate those for a large portion of organic space, which is really important. The force field is going to make or break whether your simulation is useful. And now we're able to extend these simulations into the microseconds. Uh, you know, years ago, back when these were started, it was a few picoseconds which is not always very interesting um, for some types of thermophysical or thermomechanical properties. But now with advances in technology, we can go and take atomistic all the way up to millions of atoms and several microseconds. Of course, that is not going to describe all of the behaviors that we're interested in. Um, surfactant morphology is a really good relevant example. Uh, in that case, we might need to go to what's called a mesoscale or coarse grain simulations. There, we're effectively describing a, uh, a single bead or particle it's a term that's used as, as many atoms. And depending on what type of coarse grain simulation, whether it's uh, you know, soft core potentials or you're using something closer to atomistic, uh, you may be describing one particle or one bead as four atoms, or you might be describing it as 20. It really depends on the scale. And then, of course, outside of mo you know, the molecular modeling, so you have the continuum. The reason to put it is to show not only that it's much longer and higher, um, but also that ultimately, which multi-scale modeling has been pushing for a long time, is being able to marry or tie all of these scales together. On the molecular side, we already do a decent job of that. Uh, information from DFT feeds into building force fields for atomistic. Oftentimes, atomistic forces or, or simulations are often used to train those coarse grain beads or particles. So we're, we're able to feed up information and also go back down the scales as well. Um, but the ultimate goal here is being able to apply all of these simulations and then connect them to every 
continuum level or higher simulation. That's a grand challenge. That's um, something that I think will be going on for a long time, uh, but it is something where for specific examples, they've had great success. So since we've talked in generalities about mice scales and molecular modeling, I think it is worth talking about, you know, what size are we talking about? What are the things we're looking at? And we go basically from one angstrom down to individual atoms and molecules up to maybe hundreds of nanometers with coarse grain simulation. So that allows us to look at things like molecules, surfactants, polymers, um, surfactant morphology, so micelles, interfaces, complex formulations, um, small you know, pieces of materials, maybe like a polymeric material. And of course, that's very disconnected from you know, the overall size and scale of your, your product at the end of the day. Um, but it is you know, worth noting that we do get useful information that can help um, give you insight into that product, whether it's in the development stage or you know, in the manufacturing stage and, you, and you're trying to push it out. So this is to orient us in the size and scale of things. Um, and the nice thing about this compared to other simulation methods that you may be familiar with is that we don't need a lot of parameters. And that's something I like to address because it gets asked all the time. If we know the chemistry and we have an idea about the representative structure or morphology, maybe it's amorphous, maybe it's a solid liquid interface, maybe it's an oil water emulsion or it's semi-crystalline, that's really all the information that we need, maybe composition if we're building a formulation, in order to build a model that's representative and a structure. And that is, you know, oftentimes what's used as a starting point to then generate more interesting information like moisture uptake in this case and you know plasticization effects of water on an amorphous starch model which might be used for thermoplastic starch so this is this is very different than having to use a lot of experimental parameters as input in different types of larger scale simulation so it means that as long as we can describe things within the chemistry molecular scale we can often generate useful models and we can do so quickly without having to have processing data or some you know, thermodynamic data as well. And so if we understand the, the chemistry, that can help us improve an innovative product. And I know that's a big leap, but there's a lot of cases where this is you know, shown to be true. And what we need to do in order to meet that is we need to think about and identify and or scope the problem and translate that problem into a modeling context. So you may think about your shampoo being too viscous or you know it doesn't dilute well enough. That, that is a real problem. Um, that's not something you would just tell to a modeler and they would be able to go off and run simulations unless they were an expert in that area of formulation science and they already knew what your product was. So oftentimes there's a conversation that you need to have with your modeler or us or someone who knows how to translate your problem, which is a large, you know, real physical scale, object scale, down to something that we can, you know, translate into simulations that can provide useful insight or predictive power. Uh, and sometimes that's hard, sometimes it's very easy, but this is, this is often where if you take the time to think about it and you're willing to think about making approximations or you're interested in reducing the scope, you can oftentimes get a lot of useful information from a representative system um, that can help translate into a, you know, solving or innovating for a product problem or a new product formulation. Okay, so now that I've laid the foundation for the time and length scales that we operate in and how we would translate things from a real world problem into a modeling context, let's talk about, you know, things like sustainability and, and how it might affect um, cosmetic or surfactant-based products and, and even packaging. I, I probably don't need to talk too much about this to the audience because I'm, I'm sure they're as uh, well aware as I am about the problems of pollution with plastics, recyclability issues, and also the need to move away from traditional petroleum-based sources to more renewable stocks, whether it's from plants, whether it's from fungi or something else. Um, and that's a difficult problem because products aren't going to necessarily reinvent themselves just because we need a new ingredient to replace one. We need to be able to design and, and simulate, uh, you know, something that's known and has existing performance behavior, um, just switching out ingredients. And of course, you know, that's all driven by a lot of regulatory factors, a lot of consumer pressure, um, and also, you know, global climate change in general. 
So thinking about more of a circular economy and how we might need to use ingredients that come from natural sources that are truly biodegradable, that's very important too. Um, polylactic acid is a great example of it's a natural occurring resource, but it degrades really well in a landfill. It does not degrade as well in the ocean. It's actually almost as bad as normal, you know, polyethylene. So we really have to think about how we source this and also perhaps modeling's, you know, uh, contribution here is being able to simulate degradation or how it might be included in a pre-existing formulation, swapping out an ingredient and being able to give you the same performance properties. And traditionally, this is done either through experimentation from in-house. Um, it could be, you know, oftentimes a dartboard method with formulation science. That's, that's, you know, something we hear very often is it's random testing. And that's somewhat reflected in, you know, how new materials have been developed for the past hundred years. So if you look at the time span for things like Velcro or Teflon or polycarbonate or even lithium batteries, it's a slow process. Um, it can be inefficient. It can be very costly. And so having you know, tools to help reduce time, uh, resources and energy required um, helps you know, keep up to date and up to speed with changing, changing trends and also the ability to create something that may be sustainable as well. And so how we tie that back to simulation is you're always going to be continuing to develop new products and sustainability is going to be part of the equation moving forward. And that might just be making changes to formulations. You can run simulations. Maybe you have benchmark simulations against, you know, existing products. And you know that if we change out one surfactant, one petro based surfactant for a plant derived surfactant, uh, we expect the same behavior. And that's something you can very quickly test with simulation that might only require a couple computers and one to two people running the simulations and analysis, as opposed to doing all the experimentation and sourcing the material. Here, sourcing a surfactant for us is drawing in and make sure we get the 3D structure right, uh, which oftentimes is, is trivial. And of course, you know, continued development is one part of it, but you're also gonna be doing new chemistry design. And a good example is bio-based packaging. So recycled packaging works, it works really well, um, but recycled is not the best solution in some cases. And also how much of recycled plastic actually gets recycled because then you end up generating more of the same problem. So moving toward packaging materials that can then, or products in general, that can not only be sustainably sourced, but also degrade over time is something that, you know, modeling can be seen as a two-pronged approach here. Uh, so that begs the question, what are we predicting and what types of properties are we going to get out of simulations? And so this is just a, a general list. Uh, these are areas or properties where we can characterize individual ingredients, whether it's stability or reactivity at the quantum mechanical level, optical and electronic properties, if that's important, or looking at new synthetic uh, pathways or catalytic mechanisms for making something. Um, in addition, we might also if the thing crystallizes or if it's a solid form, we may want to characterize it at a very low structural level. Uh, and those are tools that we can do on individual ingredients, maybe one or two ingredients. That's harder to do on a full formulation. But oftentimes a lot of, you know, you're synthesizing something that might be done on an individual ingredient or if you're, you know, processing something from a, a natural source. Moving up to, you know, product formulation, right? So actually, you know, the entire list of ingredients or, or sets of the ingredients that matter, picking, you know, drop-in replacements or a new preservative or a different buffer source or different um, pH conditioned, uh, you name it. Um, this is where product formulation and molecular dynamics simulation methods are often very useful for getting things like, their, you know, mechanical, um, relative viscosity, product surface interactions phase transitions and, and processing conditions, which are really important and things that have been modeled successfully in the past. And of course, since most products go into some type of packaging, understanding what's the stability of that packaging, maybe shelf life, that's a, it's a very tough problem, but it's inescapable. And being able to run simulations that might be able to give you some insight or decision factors for product shelf life testing, which might take a year. If you can run the simulations in a week or a month, you might be able to save yourself if you can calibrate it against your particular product and packaging materials. And of course, looking at the interaction, right? Making sure your, your product is staying stable, your packaging is, you know, making an oxygen barrier, it's retaining it, it's controlling moisture, 
um, whether that's going in or out. Uh, and also, is it not leaching or are there things in your packaging that are getting in your product that are either degrading and reducing shelf life or in fact, you know, creating unwanted hazardous materials, carcinogens um, that may end up inside our bodies if we put a cream on, if we use a particular shampoo. So this is where simulation really can list things it can do and insight it can provide. And I'm going to give a couple examples here of, of how that might work. And I'm going to start with surfactants and surfactant-based formulations. It's very common in personal care products, shampoos, cosmetics, creams, um, oil and water emulsions, water and oil emulsions are, are, you know, dominate a lot of these, the products that we see and also how are we able to simulate those? So surfactant simulations have been around for 20, 30 years now. Um, this is really where coarse grain simulation took off um, in the early 2000s was finding that atomistic simulation was really not able to get the right phase transitions maybe as a function of surfactant concentration or morphology um, in a short period of time, or the size was just too large. We're talking 10 million plus atoms, and 20 years ago, those simulations would have taken, you know, it'd still be running today um, on that current hardware at the time. Of course, now we're fast with all atom simulations, but sometimes we're not fast enough and we need to, to move to a higher life scale. Um, and having done that and having parameterized different types of coarse grain modeling, force fields and simulations, we've been able to predict phase diagrams and even more complicated things like liposome structure. So uh, even as far as complex nano emulsions are able to be modeled with this and we can get the right time and length scales in so that we can start taking real formulations and we can predict what it might look like under a certain set of environmental conditions and then if we change those how does the how does the formulation you know rearrange itself or react and i'm going to use a very simple example to start something like a glycolipid you know moving towards more green surfactants and looking at it emulsifying something like a simple hydrocarbon so you build a simulation you pick your concentrations um, there's water there it's just not visible and then you run a simulation. So then you might, you know, look at it after 50 nanoseconds, 100 nanoseconds, 10 microseconds. It really depends on what the the time scales that are, you know, intrinsic to whatever system you're looking at. But even in something simple as a 50 second nan or 30 second nanosecond simulation, something you can do in an afternoon, you can easily see that we can capture things like emulsification, so oil water separation, right? So forming my cells or small emulsions and so this is really just taking chemistry composition and showing how we can simulate a process and this can probably be done in a day on a single gpu card and besides just looking at you know morphology or saying okay that's fine it creates an emulsion of this size and if i change these components it change this way we would like to get more experimental properties because those are more relevant to performance behavior. So things like critical micelle concentration, something that is sometimes difficult to run the simulation, but it can be done and you can you can get a sense of, you know, where is your CMC and how you change things like salt, ionic strength or pH, how that might shift. Uh, you look at surface tension, you can get things like foaming, the say, behavior or even you know morphology changes so this is all types of properties that you can predict with some degree of accuracy sometimes it's rank ordering for 10 20 different formulations uh, sometimes it's quantitative other times it's just is it better or is it worse um, and that is usually good enough uh, it really depends on the application but you know being able to get at these properties in some way and then be able to predict them with some level of confidence is often insight that you may need a lot of experimentation to get otherwise so switching to the coarse grain since i think it's worth talking about a little bit more in detail i, I kind of went through the process how you take atoms and you move them into beads this is what it would look like um, so dppc uh, lecithin it's naturally occurring lipid uh, and it's very easy to translate something like this into a coarse grain model. And, and Martini happens to be one of the popular force fields that works really well. We'll, we'll talk about it with a few other examples. Um, but being able to pick beads and convert an all atom system to a coarse grain system, is, uh, this is often the most challenging part. So if you can either use an existing coarse grain force field that has, uh, you know, a bunch of rules built in and very easy ways 
decide how to course grain your system, or you might have to use some iterative automated approach. We can we can do either if we really want to. Um, and it also you know allows us to explore more complicated things like phase diagrams. So um, this is just an example of a common you know product. So Colase, which is a stool softener, um, it's mainly one uh, one surfactant, um, which is sodium di to ethyl hexyl uh, sulfyl succinate. Um, it can be coarse grained using you know martini strategy, which is well established. So you can create you know your your oil, your water. And then you can build the concentrations and you can run these simulations and you can start exploring, you know, what's the morphology like for some landing somewhere on the phase diagram between your surfactant water and uh, oil concentrations. In this particular case, it's a bicontinuous emulsion. And as you add more water to the system, the water, cha the water channels get bigger and bigger in size. And you can actually go and compare the diameter of those water channels against something like uh, small angle x-ray scattering to get the separation. So then you can take you know, a simple simulation and geometric properties and you can correlate it back to make sure that you're in the right space. And then if you have confidence there, you can go and, and change concentrations, really explore the rest of the phase diagram that you may not want to do experimentally and know that you're going to be getting the right thing because you compared it against some experimental readout. Of course, we, you know, this is this is personal care products, things like shampoo um, that are, you know, have a multitude of properties, right? It needs to be viscous. It also needs to be able to, you know, break down uh, when it, it gets diluted. Um, and there are certain properties for foaming, thickness, and cleaning that it needs to be able um, to perform, or it's not going to work well. And you know, traditionally, you have things like laurel sulfate, SDS, or you know, one of the more common ones that's in a lot of shampoos now. Uh, which is uh, sodium laurel lauris sulfate. And, you know, the SLE1 is the amount of EO groups. It goes from one to three normally. Um, and they have very complex morphology that is often hard to characterize experimentally and also um, can sometimes be a pain to do with even coarse grain simulations. And just to walk you through, oftentimes um, formulators will salt in for a shampoo to help with the viscosity, and that's going to have dramatic effects on the morphology of the oil water emulsion. Um, in this particular case, for SLES um, one or I think even two in particular, you're going to go from spherical at low concentration, um, and even saying at a constant concentration, maybe below 10% weight, um, you'll see that as you add more and more salt, you'll go from spherical micelles to rod-like micelles to worm-like and then branched. And this is really important understanding this behavior if you're going to model complex shampoo formulations and try to develop new ones. So this has been done with soft core potentials, which are dissipated particle dynamics. I won't get too much into that. Uh, but these types of coarse grain simulations rely on um, characterizing the beads either relative to each other and also um, can take a lot of fine tuning and it moves away from something like martini where we have you know pretty much this type of bead goes with this type of a of, of functional organic group so being able to to replicate this with something like martini would be very useful because you get extra information like hydrogen bonding or also specific electrostatic interactions that you sometimes will miss with something like a dpd simulation and so, you know, walking through how you'd actually do this, again, these are known bead types. So coarse graining the system is not that challenging, at least at the start. Um, and then being able to tune these interactions against, you know, your five or seven beads for your slush systems. And then of course your water and your, 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 your salt um, are pretty well established. But being able to get that oftentimes tuning of the coarse grain parameters, a project that we have working actively right now, and um, you know some of the the earliest things that we like to capture, which hasn't been done with this type of coarse grain model, is showing at least as a function of, of of surfactant concentration alone, we can go up from spherical to worm-like to branch to entangled to lamellar with just doing these coarse grain simulations. Uh, so this is an active project. We're working on a lot more characterization and also thinking about other environmental conditions that might change the morphology. But we're seeing the right behavior. This is this is almost textbook surfactant morphology, and we're seeing that we can replicate this pretty well. And of course, 
that's one surfactant, that one system. We want to go to larger things. We want to do many components. We want to put in multi surfactants. We want to put in buffer that's not just water and salt, simple salts. We want to put preservatives in there. And so we have to go through and, and parameterize each one. And that has traditionally been very difficult, but we've done several things to make this a lot easier. Um, one being, at least for the dissipated particle side, we've come up with automated methods so you can run an all-atom simulation, maybe like this one. And we should be able to, with deciding an initial V topology for each component, surfactant, otherwise, it should be able to run these all-atom simulations and then translate that into forces that we've represented at a force grain level. Uh, and ultimately, we'd want to replicate this for Martini so that you could use a simple V topology, which it should be smart enough to gas based on the chemistry that you provide it and then refine those parameters so that you're able to get the right either morphology or particular phase behavior that you're looking at for something as complex as this and so this is ongoing work but it's something that's been done and we can do this with all atom it just depends on what information we're after and also what scale so we'd ideally like to take this to a much larger scale um, with martini and I'll show an example actually for skin creams where, where this has been done outside of Schrodinger. Um, but the technology is there and we can do this. So we can address things like real representative product formulations um, and not just simple single surfactant systems. So that's modeling a formulation or addressing modeling formulations. Um, another key component is modeling how does the product behave uh, in action or on a biological substrate? How does your shampoo interact with your hair surface? What type of hair do you have if you've done all, gone for a lot of perms over the years and your hair is damaged? Um, or, you know, is it, you know, pretty well kept and you haven't done too much chemical treatment? What type of skin model are you using to understand how creams might get absorbed different active ingredients? Um, being able to understand how to not only build these models, but how they might be useful in simulating and predicting performance behavior for a product is is a big challenge but a lot of headway has been made in the past five ten years so you know two examples i'll walk through which is you know skin perm permeation or absorption um, and also you know generating hair models to look at how a shampoo or different ingredients might interact or absorb on a hair surface um, these are complex you know uh, biological systems we can talk about hair morphology at least for hair fibers alone go through everything you know the inner filaments the medulla the cmc all the way up to the upper cuticle which is the outer hair surface um, but it depends on what we're modeling right for shampoos that are trying to look at the surface we may be able to get away with just modeling the outer layer of the hair um, for skin which has a lot of layers of stratum chromium right a lot of bilayers on the top that are dead we may be able to model just those membranes so just that stratum corneum and look how individual ingredients like something like testosterone or vitamin e or a might absorb and so being able to translate the model into a context right the problem into a model or translate the model into a context that we can run relevant simulations is tough but the, there are ways of doing it now and there are more and more publications coming out that allow you to do this so the first one i'll, I'll talk about is, is is generating hair surfaces not to go too far into the hair chemistry and, and hair biology but the outer layer of your hair is a thin layer um, just talking about the epicuticle or the f layer here that comprises two proteins that are amorphous no known structures and it is coated by a branched methyl fatty acid called 18-MEA. And 18-MEA is thought to give the lubricant and hydrophobic protective barrier layer properties that our ha hair has so that it doesn't get stuck when it slides against another hair follicle or um, it's bacteria static. So things that sit on your hair don't get in and destroy your hair. And so there are no known experimental models. Um, there are few publications, at least in the coarse grain realm, that use reduced hair models. And then there's maybe one all atom one that even talks about addressing a protein that's 10 plus years ago now at this point, and all it did was build the model. So we, we've gone ahead and, and, and built what we think are really good representative models, incorporating one of the two proteins that are, are known, um, using a homology model to come up with the best starting structure at least. Um, given that there's no high resolution data, we're going off of tens of different papers that have little pieces of information that allow us to build a representative model. And then knowing that this 18-MEA, this fatty acid, will get stripped off the hair surface as you treat it, 
um, as it ages and also as it goes from the root to the tip, we're able to modify the surface density coverage of ATMEA so we can generate something like a pristine or a virgin hair model, as it's generally called, or um, different levels of damage. And then we can look at how those hair surfaces react to different conditions. So I'll take a pristine hair surface model and, and we can look at it as a dry surface where the 18 MEA, which is colored in orange, the, the protein is blue, um, how it might cover the surface. So at this surface density, in the absence of any other fatty acids or other things um, that either may occur naturally or be provided as a conditioning product, uh, the 18 MEA is able to cover the protein surface, you know, create that hydrophobic layer. Now, when you add the surface, of course, they're very hydrophobic, so they're not going to interact very well with the water. They're going to want to try to find something like, right, so something else that's hydrophobic. And we can see how um, the, the changes in 18-MEA, they're going to start interacting with others. They're going to expose more surface, allowing moisture to penetrate into the hair. Um, that's a known phenomenon. Water does absorb hair, I think it's 20 plus percent in some cases. Um, and it's known that regardless of whether there's damage or not, water still will penetrate down below the surface. So we can look at systems like that. We can also look at if we add something like a, a fatty acid, something like steric or palmitic acid, which are the two here, um, how they might you know, help or change the surface behavior. So in the dry case, if you add you know, exogenous, steric and palmitic acid, they will absorb, they will intercalate pretty well with 18-MEA. Um, and if you wet that same surface, you might see that they're able to form more of a protective layer and expose less of your protein layer. So more things that can get down into the hair that may not be as easy to clean. Or if you need to have things that penetrate like dyes or other behaviors, or you need to create multi-layer surfaces, um, understanding how your base layer, right, the, the base biological substrate works is really important. To expand on that, since we want to look at water penetration, and it's known that uh, it happens regardless of whether there's damage or not, that's been shown experimentally, we wanted to check and validate that that works. So what we're looking at up top are density plots that show you actually going from the top to the bottom. Um, the system is symmetric, that, that's actually just a, a, a technical reason for doing that. So we're seeing two surfaces at one time. Um, and we can see that, you know, the protein is pretty much the same, but when we add water, water is able to pen penetrate into the protein layer uh, and more of it will actually penetrate if you have more damage. There's less hydrophobic layer to prevent it from being absorbed into that initial protein layer, that outer layer of your hair. Um, that is in agreement with the experiment. That was really nice to see. Um, what we next thought about was, okay, if we have fatty acids that might be in a conditioning product, um, how does that change, you know, moisture absorption? And we see a reduction, so that's that purple line. Um, now we're seeing that it's similar, not exactly the same for damaged hair versus virgin hair, but it's very close. And so what this tells us is that it is increasing the hydrophobic barrier properties. Um, and we're able to see this by just running simulations with this surface that we generated. And a lot of consideration went into generating that model um, and then trying to apply whether it's product ingredients or looking at simple wetting behavior. Now to switch gears, and I'm just going to provide one example. This was not done by Schrodinger, um, but another set of, of academic groups was looking at complex um, emulsion for skin absorption. So there are a lot of simulation papers out there that look at this. You can have membranes and individual components and, and you can look at what is the, the energy required for them to penetrate the membrane. You can get a relative sense of permeability um, and also organization. Uh, but understanding how something that might be a full product and how that might arrange itself into something like a nano emulsion and how that might absorb on the surface is, is an entirely different subject. You go from very simple atom simulation, simple being a relative term, to a very large coarse grain simulation. And so this has been done, this was published actually earlier this year, um, where they looked at 15 different components, um, very common things that might be in a nanomulsion for vitamin delivery, um, showing that they can take these systems, they can very quickly build a nanomulsion that's you know tens of nanometers wide um, or in diameter, and that it's stable. And then they can do absorption. So looking at, you know, skin membranes, building those models and looking at if we run the simulation, we put the droplet very close to the skin surface. How does that deform the membrane? What type of molecules are able to permeate the membrane first? If it's something like a hydration, what sticks on top? And how does that change the membrane at the end of the day? So 
you know, these are different problems. Uh, they have different biological substrates that can be modeled. And we have different ways of looking at different types of behavior. These are just two examples using even hair, um, and, and in this case, vitamin A and vitamin E delivery. Uh, but you can imagine that you could do this for more complex systems. You could have more complex formulations. You could change things. You could even talk about maybe, you know, looking at under mechanical strain or different mechanical deformations, how that might affect absorption on hair, right? So it has that nice, you know, lubricant property. Or if you need to, you know, rescue damaged hair and put something on top of it, will then restore that property as, you know, friction between sliding hair follicles or how you might look at absorbing different molecules within a skin surface and how you would want to simulate that and how big you might need to make your system. So uh, one last thing I want to talk about that I want to give a, a relevant industry example is, is the packaging side of this. So how do you know, your products interact with your packaging, right? So there's in the bottle or in the container, then there's you know, in action. We just talked about in action. Let's talk about how you, know, you might study things like product packaging and how you might address shelf life. So it's known, and I'm going to go through a, an example I think everyone you know, either has heard about or can relate to about how Packaging can sometimes contain contaminants or other things that we don't want in our product. Um, you know, PFAs are very popular. You'll hear them on TV, um, on news segments. You'll see them in scientific articles. You know, they're, they're polyfluorinated molecules. They're not very good for you. Um, and you do consume some of them when you're talking about, you know, different types of packaging like phthalates. Um, or you might have some type of siloxane that you might use as a cooking coating surface for muffins or something like that, or you have a plastic coating inside your cream bottle. Uh, understanding how packaging might leach into and how it might degrade your product is really important and something that um, you know, will ultimately reduce the shelf life if you don't pay attention to it. And that relatable example um, is BPA and polycarbonate bottles. So, you know, during the 90s and the 2000s, there was a concern that, you know, bisphenol A, BPA, which is used to make polycarbonate, but there's also some residual BPA in your polycarbonate, along with, a plat you know, dyes and other additives, dyes, you know, for colored, you know, water bottles that, you know, you may have purchased at one point or another. Um, they have been shown in some cases to be toxic, um, you know, BPA at one point during a CDC study conducted in the U.S. showed that more like two thirds of, uh, of participants had uh, BPA in their urine. So we're obviously consuming it. Um, it's been thought to, to be carcinogenic. So understanding and trying to mitigate potential leaching of BPA is really important. Um, they banned it in baby bottles. So you can't make polycarbonate um, baby formula bottles anymore. Um, and most companies, if you see now, if you buy something in the store, it's BPA free, it has the label on it. So, you know, understanding and being able to simulate this is, is, is very important because it's not, it's known that poly, you know, BPA is not supposed to get into water. There's been a fair number of studies say that at room temperature. Um, even maybe it's slightly elevated, but that, you know, is just water. What about other things? So, and, and maybe I should take a step back and say, you know, we're looking at now, you know, look an interface. So a beverage or a product, it could be solid, it could be liquid, uh, and an actual interface of your plastic, which may be a barrier coating. It could just be the plastic itself. It could be a multi-layer. But you can, if you can, you know, you can build a molecular model to be representative of it. You can put your contaminants, your additives, everything in there, and then you can put your product on top of it. So this is this is a, a system that is high ethanol. It's actually probably like an overproofed alcohol. It's 60% ethanol and 40% water. Um, and here it illustrates that you know, as you change environmental conditions, going from room temperature even to something like a very hot day on the back of a truck or in a very arid, dry climate in the summer, um, you may not have any BPA, which is a little green molecule, you know, leaching into your product at room temp, but as you elevate, you'll see more of it is drifting into your solution, and that as you get higher in temperature, you may see more and more of that. Um, it's worth noting that it's not just anything will drift in there, right? It's solvent interaction with the product, and also the dye is not miscible with the you know ethanol water solution. So even though there's both BPA and dye in our in our little plastic polycarbonate model, 
um, we only see the BPA, which is known. So this is, you know, nice confirmation. Um, and then we can go and compare other things. So it's known that it shouldn't dissolve, you know, shouldn't leach into water as often. Um, and if you look at the simulations comparing both the ethanol system, again, these are examples that are really nice to convey a point. Um, you don't see any BPA leaching into water, but if you add ethanol into the system at any temperature above room temperature, you do see BPA leaching. So this is a really nice example of how we can build a, a simple plastic interface for a package container. It doesn't necessarily have to be plastic, it could be something else. And we can take even just the simplest products and illustrate how leaching you know, migration might occur. And this is really nice. These are pretty pictures, they're all qualitative. What if we want to quantify that? So if we want to look at diffusion and not just diffusion within the plastic, but BPA lateral diffusion or in this case, we're using vertical to z-axis. It just depends on your, your reference frame here. Um, how it might diffuse and quantify that. Uh, so taking a particular temperature, you know, what might it diffuse in versus, um, you know, at 300 versus 400 or 350, 400 is a little high. Um, but understanding how it might diffuse less in one dimension until you heat it up and breaking that down. And so we can show, you know, what the isotropic diffusion is versus how it might diffuse in a particular axis. And also, again, like the hair models, where is everything in the system? So these are ways of quantifying that would be very difficult to do experimentally, um, but also give you a lot of insight, again, something that's already pretty well known. So in the last few minutes, I just want to, you know, highlight how this works in the real world, because I can sit here and give you, you know, nice, pretty compact examples until I'm low in the face. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's used by you know real companies that are making real products. So this is a case study. This is done with a very large consumer packages company, Reckitt. Um, they make many different things in the personal care space uh, and also personal hygiene space, um, cleaning space. They do a lot. And for them, you know, challenges are including, you know, being able to change requirements and develop suitable, you know, sustainable materials and being able to do this quickly and using it, you know, in this case, they were adopting a digital chemistry strategy from us and being able to get data very quickly so that they can address a multitude of different issues. And these are just some that are highlights. Uh, this is, you know, what we're able to talk about. Obviously, there's a lot more going on, um, and, and often that's the case. Some of the best and most interesting stories we can't talk about because of confidentiality agreements. Um, but this case, Reckitt was it was very kind enough to allow us to talk about, you know, using it in different types of scenarios for different products to help guide them and make decisions faster. And so, one particular case is looking at how fabrics, detergent, and polymer coatings might affect absorption onto a fabric, so using a, a fabric surface system, and then being able to understand what particular combination in the formulation for their detergent was able to either remove dirt or was able to be washed and then you know rinsed off of the system or if it's stuck on the surface. Um, being able to make formulations, in this case, using over-the-counter drugs ingredients, so it could be an active, it could be a formulation or a cosmetic or something else, um, but combining it with different polymers and surfactants and looking at, you know, an environmental condition like pH, how they might be able to get the right type of selection for how they want a particular active ingredient to interact with that formulation, um, knowing that it might sit in a bottle at one pH, but then when it's in action, it's in use, it's going to, you know, whether it's stomach, which is very low pH, or on a skin surface or hair surface, which is going to be slightly higher pH. And then also being able to select um, packaging based upon maybe miscibility or compatibility. Um, here we're not really talking about what that is, um, but if we're picking a particular polymer you know, candidate for a packaging material and our different ingredients, we can rank order which ones are most compatible, most likely to um, be a suitable candidate for their given criteria or which ones are gonna be least compatible and then they can turn and make decisions based on this. And, and make decisions based on this, you know, is this something they're just doing in the background that's not really impacting day-to-day -day operations or business, but, um, you know, from uh, Martin Settle, the, the global uh, R&D packaging sustainability manager, points out that they were able to take modeling with no experience. They, they're not modelers. They are experts in other areas, um, but they were able to, with training from us uh, and also some guiding and help along the way, we're able to take their modeling and deliver significant impact on decision making um, with several different business units. And 
you know, they quote in some cases they see a 10x uh, increase in speed compared to traditional experiment only uh, methods. So this is this is you know a testament to not just Schrodinger as a company trying to sell you software or sell you services to to do better, but this is something that real companies are using today, and they are using to help accelerate their R&D timelines, their sustainability goals, and they're able to apply it in a multitude of different areas. And so I think that's a that's a good note to end on, um, and just kind of you know circle back here to what we talked about, right? Since there are a lot of different things, you know, formulations and understanding them, how modeling can be used within the right context and the right framing, uh, understanding things like surf and surfactant morphology, how it affects by environmental conditions, product packaging interactions, you know, addressing sustainability issues, um, thinking about how your products might behave, you know, in action or whether you're dealing with, you know, a new sustainable ingredient on a hair surface or on a, as a skin cream or as a packaging material. Molecular modeling techniques and an overall digital chemistry strategy can help address these issues and provide actual insight and impact. Um, that's not to say that molecular modeling is going to replace experiments. I, I wouldn't be, you know, I wouldn't even begin to think that you, you stop doing experiments. Modeling alone um, or experiments alone, in, in both in different vacuums, are not going to help each other. The idea is, is that modeling can provide not only synergy between experiments, providing additional insight, rationalization to behavior, but it can also help narrow the search so you can do less experiments. And if you're doing less experiments, you're reducing the amount of materials you're using, the energy, and you're making decisions faster because we can simulate a lot more conditions, a lot more formulations, uh, and a lot more different behavior a lot faster than waiting for synthesis or material sourcing, then testing and then experimentation and then analysis of that. We can do it a lot faster. And that it works and, and there are actual real companies using it today and um, are using it not just in one particular area, but in several different areas. And so on that note, um, I will say thank you to everybody for, for sticking with me through the hour. Uh, it's a lot of topics. Uh, we try to tell coherent stories or at least pieces of stories. There's, you know, 30, 40 more examples we could talk about, um, things that I may not address that you're interested in, but know that, you know, modeling is worked well in the things I've talked about, but it's worked in a lot of other areas as well. And, and of course, always happy to talk about that. Um, if you have questions, please reach out. Um, and on that, I'll just thank everybody and turn it back over to Scott. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. So, as usual, a very informative and interesting presentation. And you packed a lot of information into, uh, into your hour. I think you could get your money's worth there. Uh, uh, there are a number of questions that spring to mind, but in the interest of time, I'd like to talk about sustainability for these personal care products with respect to both the packaging and the products after they're washed out of our hair or washed off our skin. Um, I assume that each of those requires a set of assumptions about the environment in which they're going to be put because obviously water is going to take away most of the actual formulation products, but the package is going to go into either the trash or in the best case, a recycling. Um, do you have a set of assumptions or even better than assumptions, conditions that you've been able to apply to this particular question of sustainability and environmental breakdown? That's an excellent question and, you, and, you, and you, you're, 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 you're already talking about the sequel here. Um, so you're right. Uh, one thing we have to worry about and something I, I don't touch on here is biodegradability. And I casually mentioned polylactic acid is something that will, you know, degrade in a few years on land, but in the ocean, it's, no, you know, it's about the same as, as polyethylene. So what, how we've thought about this in terms of degradation is looking at, you know, what's the degradation of a, of a bio a polysaccharide, let's just say a thermoplastic that we're using. So we have the ability to predict degradation using QM. So we have to break it down either into individual ingredients or we can just look at full sets of them. We can predict how those molecules or, or, or other, even in some cases, you know, in emulsions, how those will degrade. 
And so then we can start to think about rank ordering. Is this something that takes a lot of energy to break down? And so therefore it may not be that biodegradable or it will readily break down and it will break, what it breaks down into is something that's harmless. Cause that's the other trick is you want it to break down but you want it to break down and not break down into things that will then be way worse for the environment as they leach into the soil or into the ocean. So there are a couple ways to address it. There's the, the actually predicting degradation I talked about, and then there's also ways of um, either screening against databases or looking at you know, actual simulations about how polymers might break apart if you mechanically you know, process them, right? So if they, you pull them real hard and they break apart very easily, not, you know, they, they have a yield point, but then they, the bonds actually start breaking apart, that would suggest, okay, this is something we might want to industrially mechanically recycle. Or if it's something where it's a dye and we want to know, is it, you know, a natural thing that can be chopped apart by enzymes or is it something that has to, you know, what, what's that dye going to look like in 30 years or, you know, how much energy would be required to break it down? We can either do that or if we know that there are molecules that can be engineered to break these things down, we can take a whole host of simulation techniques in that direction. So it's, a, it's more of a, you know, we can address it in multiple ways. Really, we're talking about, you know, either physically breaking it down, whether we're doing those simulations or chemically we're breaking them down either through interactions with water, um, tailored enzymes, which are becoming popular, uh, or just looking at how it might naturally break down and compare it against known things that might take a short amount of time or a very long period of time. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for one more question? I do. Okay, we have a question. Have oligomer distributions been taken into account in describing the properties of a surfactant surface interaction or emulsification? So you can. We have done it in some cases. So you, you actually have to look at polydispersity um, or if you're just talking about polymer size. Um, of course, simulations are going to be smaller than maybe some of your very long chain um, say polyethylene just as an example um, you don't necessarily need to go to the full length in a lot of cases you can still recover thermomechanical properties and it's been shown pretty well um, without going to the full length but you can look at those and you can actually look if you're not go talking about going the, the long direction the shorter direction um, you can make very poly dispersed polymers or even surfactants and look at how they'll affect morphology or product packaging interactions it's all capable of being done it's just you know what's the goal of the, the project and the simulations and what's the level of detail you need to take into account but yes it can be done and we do have a few studies where we've looked at it and um, i'd be happy to discuss that more one more question yes obviously in your position you are seeing opportunity that's like an embarrassment of riches so if there's one opportunity, one question they wish somebody would come and ask you, because you think personally, this is a really exciting question. Do you have such a question or maybe two? So I have a few. Um, so one thing that, that's, that's often done, um, and this is usually due to time constraints and that is, we'll show specific examples for specific chemistry. And oftentimes, right, we're dealing within a library of a chemical space. I'll say a library because it's a very bad way of describing it. Or we have one surfactant or 10 surfactants. A large scale simulation of maybe a thousand surfactants, everything for maybe just particular properties. Or let's look at the migration of plastics into and, and, and contaminants in the food products. Um, there's, a, there's a wealth of data. Um, there are even databases now from the Packaging Forum, um, which is a nonprofit organization that has all that data. It would be great if someone were to ask, let's, let's, let's simulate everything or let's simulate you know, enough that we could build a machine learning model and take everything we have known in the literature, which is sometimes a lot of data, uh, and then simulate it and then look at the distribution and can we, we pick up on trends or, or can we have a library of simulations built that we could extend or, or, or spin off to do something else. That's always the question that doesn't get asked because commercial companies, um, and this is not in any way uh, a criticism, is they're making products, right, and they're working with approved regulated things and they're oftentimes trying to avoid those contaminants or additives getting into products. So they don't want to, to focus on you know, the things they're trying to avoid. It'd be very interesting to me to look at all of that and see what common, you know, what trends 
or what insight can we gather that might change the way people think about designing new materials because uh, we have a ton of data that we can screen or we can reference against. So yeah, I'd say, you know, in general for me, it's, it's taking when there's a lot of data and there are some cases where there are saying, what if we did all of it? And then what will we get out of it? And I would, I would wager a fair bit that we would get a lot of useful information and then that data in and of itself would be extremely valuable to other people. And the food and product packaging interactions and migrations is just one example because I know of it and it's public data. So that, that for me would be you know, large scale. That would be one that would be really exciting to work on and give you a lot of insight very quickly. Wow. Well, thank you very much for your attendance and, and your uh, to the audience and to this wonderful presentation. Uh, my conscience doesn't permit me to stretch this out any longer. So uh, with that, we will take our leave and uh, thank you so much. I look forward to your next webinar. I hope that'll be in the in the mix here for you. Thank you. And I'm sure I'll be talking to, to you and everyone else soon. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. Have a good